Good afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to discuss for a part of the class the new class war uh, from Michael Lynn, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. I'm curious, how many of you have read this book before? It's not that well known. We think it's important and uh, very helpful for understanding the trajectory of the United States uh, over the past um, 40 or so years. Uh, how many of you like the book? They've read you. Um, and, if you, and if you have critiques of it, you should let us know. I want to begin uh, just by summarizing his central themes, and uh, then we'd like to uh, discuss um, uh, structural change in America. We are we have a um, uh, we want to um, uh, critique Lind or move beyond him in a sense. Uh, but first, he, he rightly points out that Europe and North America are experiencing the greatest revolutionary wave of protests since the 1960s or in the 1930s. Uh, the issue and the central thesis really is about power. That any nation um, who in, that invests power in one group and not divides power over different groups is destined um, to uh, implode. The first class war in the West began in the Gilded Age to industrialization, which we've talked about. Reforms were partial and very limited until mobilizing for war. And Lynn doesn't say this, but there's um, there's a, a, re a, a recent book that, uh, on the importance of um, war in the United States that helps to democratize the citizenship both in terms of uh, poor, but also in terms of racial and ethnic groups. And that and the thesis is, uh, it's called the Unsteady March, um, that uh, the only times there's been progress in terms of democratization in the United States is in and in the wake of a war, a, a major war in which the United States is uh, in danger of being defeated by a powerful, very threatening enemy. And those, um, ex those uh, examples are in the Revolutionary War, um, in World War, uh, in the Civil War, um, not in World War I because the United States was not in it that much, uh, and in uh, uh, the World War II. Those are the only instances in which there's a dramatic transformation um, of uh, society in many respects. Um, in and after World War II, dem democratic pluralism occurred. Power brokers who worked with working class and rural constituencies bargained with elites in government, economy, a culture, and other realms. So in other words, uh, these workers had a seat at the table, had power. In this era of democratic pluralism, the societies of North Atlantic enjoyed mass prosperity and reduced inequality. Arguably, more uh, a, a, a greater, comparatively greater degree of equality in terms of cultural and economic um, terms uh, in uh, the nation's history. From the 1960s to the present, there was a declining fear of a great power conflict, and this reduced the incentives of Western elites to make concessions to Western working classes. Post -war, the post-war system has been dismantled in a revolution from above by elites uh, that promotes material interests and values of college-educated uh, minority of managers and professionals who replaced old-fashioned bourgeois capitalists as the dominant elite. And so that's how he bring, comes up with the term of a technocratic neoliberalism replaces a democratic pluralism. Corporations have fueled the deunionization of labor and the deregulation to the detriment of workers. He sees unionization as part of this uh, collaboration between union, between workers and managers that in the post uh, World War II period until the 60s was uh, led to huge advances in all fronts in terms of economic, cultural, uh, and political uh, 
aspects. The technocratic neoliberalism replaced democratic pluralism. Corporations have fueled the deunionization of workers and labor deal regulation to the detriment of workers. Firms embrace global labor arbitrage in the form of offshoring production to poor workers abroad or employing immigrant workers to weaken unions and escape constraints of national labor relations. So in other words, workers no longer have a voice within a uh, company or a corporation or within the economic uh, sphere. In politics and government, local mass membership organizations have given way to parties controlled by donors and media consultants. The power of national legislatures has been usurped by or delegated to executive agencies, courts, or transnational bodies in which college-educated professionals have far more influence than working-class majorities, whether native or foreign-born. And the culture, including the media culture, educate, culture of education, religious and civic watchdogs, have lost power, immense power often as a result of activism by judges born into the social elite who share their libertarian and social views with university-educated peers. Uh, and so this is a technocratic, revo neoliberal revolution from above, uh, and it's carried out by the elite, by members of aggressive and powerful uh, managerial elite, provoking this populist backlash from below by a defensive and disempowered native working class, many of whom are non-white. In fact, a substantial minority of black and ethnic British voters supported Brexit. And in the US, roughly 30% of Latinos voted for Trump in 2016. This large number of alienated working class voters believing the political systems are rigged and that mainstream parties ignore their interests, have embraced demagogic populists. In the United States, it's Trump, but it's also Miguel Farage, Boris Johnson, Marie Le Pen, Matteo Salvini. So he doesn't elaborate, but he does a nice job at, at showing how what's happening in the United States is also happening in other major countries. These populist demagogues launched similar counterattacks on dominant neoliberal establishments in all three realms of power. In the economy, populists favor national restrictions on trade and immigration in order to shield workers from competing with imports and immigrants and sending um, factories into China or other countries to uh, uh, create uh, the goods at far lower prices. In politics, populists denounce neoliberal parties and factions as corrupt and elitist, even when a populist leader like Trump is himself in one sense elitist, but he speaks very effectively uh, to his base. In culture, populists denounce elite promulgated multiculturalism and globalism, they flout norms of political correctness that marks membership in the university educated managerial elite. We're part of what Lynn is calling this managerial elite. Sharing wealth through redistribution and symbolic gestures of respect are unlikely to end this new class war if the small managerial overclass is not willing to share genuine power with the working class majority. And that's in a sense his central thesis, the period from World War II until the 1960s, the elites did agree to share power uh, with working class majorities, particularly in terms of unions. A genuine class peace in democracies of, uh, democracies of the West Lynn writes, will require uniting and empowering both native and immigrant workers while restoring genuine decision-making power to the non-university educated majority in all three realms of power, the economy, politics, and culture. Uh, and so his, his 
three bullet point thesis is that demagogic populism is the symptom, technocratic neoliberalism is the disease, democratic pluralism is the cure. Um, he relies um, heavily on James Barnum and John Kenneth Galbraith, Galbraith's theory of countervailing power where union workers collaborate with corporate heads to achieve uh, both a voice within the negotiating table on power and a very um, robust uh, political economy uh, from the end of uh, World War II uh, through um, uh, into the 1960s. Um, he also borrows from George Orwell, who summarizes it. Yeah, Lind essentially looks back to uh, this James Burnham, um, who was who influenced, uh, who was, uh, and also John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, but Burnham, Burnham's book, The Managerial Revolution, this was in 1939, argued that in an era of large-scale capitalism and the bureaucratic state, the older bourgeoisie, middle class, was being replaced by the new managerial class and uh, warned against the social dominance of this uh, new ruling class. Uh, and uh, Orwell summarized it by saying it will be a new kind of planned central society, neither capitalist nor democratic. Rulers will control the means of protection, business executives, technicians, bureaucrats, and soldiers will become managers. This managerial society will not consist of a patchwork of small independent states, but of a great super state grouped around the main industrial centers in America, Europe, and Asia. And they will fight among themselves for possession of uncaptured portions of the earth. Um, and for Lynn, Orwell's super state exists today under NATO, NAFTA, EU, Russians, Eurasian Economic Union, and informal influences in China. Um, and Burnham's theory of managerial revolution, and I agree with him, is similar to John Kenneth Galbraith's economic theory, in which both believed that a new ruling elite had displaced the old bourgeoisie and aristocracy. And uh, Galbraith refers to the new elite as the techno-structure. Um, and that such that managers are private and public bureaucrats who run large national and global corporations, government agencies, nonprofits. They exercise disproportionate influence in politics and society by virtue of their institutional positions in large, powerful bureaucracies. Most of today's billionaires were born into this university-educated, credential, bureaucratic, upper-middle class, and their heirs tend to disappear back into it in a generation or two. Um, and Lind uses higher ed as a market of membership in, the, um, in this uh, overclass um, in, in such a way that mark managers and professionals become inbred, self-perpetuating, uh, and his solution really is this, what Galbraith, he borrows heavily from Galbraith's uh, vision of countervailing power such that um, these elites work with workers, collaborate, share some of the power and the wealth and the voice such that they're working together rather than being enemies. And it manifests itself uh, in terms of the failure of doing so with um, where we are now with um, a uh, populist, um, a very influential and effective populist um, who also happens to oppose the very concept of democracy uh, of being reelected. You want me to stop there or keep going? <laughs> <laughs> You want to say more? <laughs> uh, I, let me elaborate a bit on um, on the the significance of world wars and new deals. Um, 
So in all of its forms, economic liberalism identifies human freedom with commercial transactions and markets, with the state limited to the role of enforcing contracts and providing minimal social insurance safety nets. Free market liberals tend to view national boundaries as unfortunate and anachronistic barriers to the free market of capital and workers in a single global market economy. And that's a problem. Socialists denounce capitalism and private property and propose public ownership of industrial infrastructure. Um, and in fact, um, Lynn has an amazing statistics, which was by the 1970s, because of this uh, alternative, this protest against free market liberals, by 1970s, the regimes of Marxist-Leninist communists ruled one-third of the human race. And that led you know, people uh, like Galbraith and other um, social, cultural economists uh, to embrace democratic pluralism uh, as a structure, an alternative um, uh, in post-1945 uh, America. In democratic pluralist era after World War II, working class majorities managed to increase their bargaining power in the economy and in government and in culture. Galbraith's notion of countervailing power of groups pooled their resources to strengthen their bargaining positions. They had a voice and power at the table in um, negotiating with corporations. And so there was a balance between workers and owners, and it was the core for Lynn of New Deal America. Um, for democracy is what results when you have a state of tension in society that permits no one group to dare bid for total power. And Lynn says today there is one group that has essentially all the power, which is uh, college educated, um, uh, college educated and especially high educated college uh, people which have constitute a very small percentage of the United States. For democracy is what results when you have a state of tension in society that permits no group to dare to bid for total power. And even the most business-friendly post-war democracies in US and Britain had mixed economies characterized by labor business bargaining and economic regulation and public spending that would have been politically impossible before the Great Depression and before World War II. Um, the first class war in the industrial West between managerial overclass and working class ended after 1945, in which the overclass and the working class collaborated in a, in a very profound way. Um, Social peace was attained by incorporating formerly marginalized workers and family met farmers into the national power structure. Democratic pluralism in North America and Europe compelled representatives of national overclasses to share power and to bargain with lesser elites who acted as power brokers for working class communities in three realms, in the economy, in government, and in culture. Um, Democratic government and Western nations were stabilized by the integration of two groups, urban labor and family farmers that had been marginalized and exploited in the early stages of managerial capitalism. And this is another aspect that led to unprecedented levels of working class prosperity uh, and uh, economic growth. Uh, and then he describes um, over the course of the book how this um, this, uh, uh, this capitalist, successful capitalist framework uh, gets destroyed uh, in uh, the 60s and 70s by um, ruling elites. Uh, and that we're in a place where uh, 
uh, he says that, uh, he points out that a, a, a literally a, a kind of a handful of college educated Americans control uh, much of uh, the economy and politics today. Well, I'll just make three brief comments, just to, and then we'll open up for a, for a discussion with the class. So my first critical comment is I think this argument of Lynn's uh, 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 misses entirely what should be a major part of the account, which is the transformation of the production system. He's talking about the realignment of classes right. and the reorganization of the class system without telling us what's happening to the productive economy right. below. Right. So, Right. This world, this right. world that you describe right. was a world in which there was stable labor force, yes. a large part of the labor force were stable, quasi-tenured workers yes. working in large productive units like factories yes. under the aegis of corporations. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that world is vanishing. It's, yes. And it's vanishing in the United States, it's vanishing all over the world. Yes. And, and, it, and it was, Economically, it was it was not it was in a sense inefficient. So he's talking about a series of institutional arrangements, like Galbraith's countervailing power, right. which were incidents of that world of yes. the, that world that has vanished. That's true. Right? He wants to resuscitate it. Yes, he wants to resuscitate it, but without any mention of how he's going to resuscitate that's the true. underlying system of production that sustained it. That's right. Uh, and without even being attentive to the institutional indeterminacy of the countervailing power that he reveres, this idea. What is the countervailing power? The countervailing power is the idea that in the employment, it's, it's essentially a legal idea. Uh, it's an idea that in the employment relation, there's radical inequality of bargaining power that radical inequality of bargaining power threatens to reduce contract to a sham, a facade. Huh? And therefore, what we must do is reestablish the reality of contract by allowing the workers to organize and bargain collectively. Correct. That's the idea. Now, in fact, there's a, there's a fork in the road because uh, it would be possible to imitate the other labor law regime that exists in the, in the world today, which is the corporatist labor law regime adopted widely in Latin America. And under one of the principles of that regime, all workers are automatically unionized according to their position in the production system. So the fact of unionization is a gift of the law. Uh, not a battle that has to be refought each day right. to preserve the union right. by showing they can deliver the goods, right? right? right. Uh, and I don't think that the adoption of that principle, highly implausible in a country like the United States, would have prevented the tendency to deunionize, but it would have slowed it down at least. Because yes, it would have created a legal that's obstacle true. That's true. that would have favored the preservation of union power. Now, so that world has disappeared, and what has replaced it? What has replaced it is the insular form of the knowledge economy, right. which we're going to discuss in a subsequent class. And so the, the argument that he presents doesn't take into account this underlying transformation of the regime of production. The second criticism is that his description of a managerial class is blind to the relevance of the distinction between who, who actually has the assets. The asset owning class, that is, it's not the case that the reality of property and the control of the means of production disappears in this phantasmagoria in which there's a, a, a shadowy managerial class. There's a distinction in this overclass, as he calls it, between who in fact owns the means of production and who serves them as this technocracy. 
And that distinction is of immense significance. But my third criticism, and the one that is most relevant to our discussion, is that because of these two deficiencies, the programmatic solutions that he proposes are all attempts to solve 21st century problems by exporting 20th century solutions, right, right, right. like the countervailing right, power. Right. And how is that to be done when the underlying realities of production have changed? Right. Uh, but let's, uh, let's open it up. Does anyone want to make a comment about this Lynn thesis? Do you want to add anything, John? I think that's a, uh, a, a very, very good summary. Um, I, I would, so the question that I have, and I don't know um, you could answer for me, is the, is in the, based on the economy and the culture in the 21st century, does the theory or the use of countervailing power have any force or um, significance at all? Do, do it would we have to be reinvented radically. That is, it can't, it can't be identified with the apparatus of traditional unionization because the productive base for that has vanished. That's right. And it can't just be reestablished by decree. Right. But a broader idea is the idea of tension among sources of power. Right. And right. organization is power. Right. So in some larger form, this idea of countervailing power could reemerge. Right. But we would have to reinterpret it radically yes. and imagine an economy organized on different principles. Uh, so what we have now, just so we, to, where would those, where would that, um, uh, the, the, uh, the we go back, power come be, from? What would be its practical base? Yes, what would be the base, and what, uh, what area would it be in politics? So would it be in it's, education, it's, would it be in, um, in uh, manufacturing? Would it, where would the base of that? Power everywhere. Be? Everywhere. Everywhere. So. If we take the insulin, so the problem now, the economic problem, the problem of production, is that there's this vanguard, right. which is a, a series of socially exclusive fringes, yes. excluding the vast majority of businesses and of workers. Right. And the project must be to create an inclusive form of this vanguardism. Right a knowledge economy for the many, right. rather than the knowledge economy for the few that exist. Right. Now that, in turn, requires collaboration, for example, between the government, right. national and local, and the producers. Uh, the object of the collaboration would be to extend the practices and resources and capital of the knowledge economy more widely. So that includes the majority. And there, there's a basis for a new form of countervailing power because the producers have to be organized, they have to cooperate with the government, and so forth. To organize, let, let, let's, let's put that in a larger context. We have in the world today two forms two models of government business relations. There's the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government. And there's the Northeast Asian model of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state imposed top down. Huh? And with some degree of variation. So, it's more top-down and centralized, say, in South Korea than it is in Taiwan. But this is its general character. So we have to imagine a third model of a form of 
strategic coordination or partnership between government and the producers that would be decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. And that would be a 21st century industrial equivalent or service equivalent to the agricultural extension of the early 19th century, which resulted in family farming with entrepreneurial attributes. So that's a focus for power. So would that, um, would that be able to solve, the, would that solve the problem of corporations having their products manufactured in China or in other countries? No, the idea is to create productive potential within the country. So would that prevent a corporation of within the United States? So would it well, that's a, that's a, a parallel discussion, right? Okay. To what ex extent should offshoring subcontracting because what's happened is that the masters of the insular knowledge economy have discovered a way to bifurcate the process of production. The, create, the creative and lucrative part they keep for themselves, the commoditized and routinized part they subcontract to workers and firms in remote parts of the world on the basis of a lower tax take, a lower wage, or labor and tax arbitrage that, that Lynn discusses. Right. Huh? Right. Uh, so that we all have to be an alternative to that. Now, if you think of the provision of public services, a similar discussion arises. Because what exists in the world by way of provision of public services is what you could describe as an administrative Fordism. That's, Fordism is in core meaning about industry, right? Uh, the large scale production of standardized goods and services with these relatively rigid machines and production processes. That was the world of conventional industry where people had these stable jobs. Huh? So what exists in the world by, by way of public services is a, an equivalent to that. It's the provision of low quality, standardized public services. Low quality meaning of lower quality than the equivalent services that can be bought on the market by someone with money uh, by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. So you can imagine that there's an alternative to administrative Fordism other than just the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. The alternative is the state provides a universal floor of minimum public services for everyone. And the state operates at the ceiling in the development and financing of the most innovative, costly, and complex public services. But in the broad middle zone between the floor and the ceiling, the state partners with independent civil society, not for profit, in the competitive and experimental provision of public services. Through cooperatives, for example, of uh, health workers or education workers. Uh, and that would be simultaneously the best way to enhance the quality of their ser the services and the strongest incentive to the self-organization of civil society outside the state. And would that be nationalized, or would it be a, uh, up to each state to determine? It could be nationalized, it could be or not, but that's another discussion, right? right? So what I'm saying is that you can imagine a whole range of ways in which the task of collective reorganization reemerges, right. but no longer against the background of conventional industry against the background of another form of production, which is the form of production we have. Yes? Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of, under this like framework and this theory, do you have thoughts on whether or not it would like devalue the, um, like a traditional education, like as we, you know, the like college degree or anything like that? Like does this change the way in which we value education in like a higher education stance versus like trade schools and things like that? I'm, I didn't quite understand what's, what's the so nub of the question. How would, the, how would you value higher education vis-a-vis -vis trade schools? Is that accurate? 
Well, I think so. In this world, which is the world of conventional industry, if you now look at the whole world rather than narrowly the United States, the most influential model of vocational practical training was the German model, based on training in job-specific and machine-specific skills. So the European idea is the elites receive general education and the workers receive vocational training. And they're radically different in character. The elite education is canonical, encyclopedic, dogmatic, doctrinal. And the practical training is how to, how to be an electrician, a plumber, or any one of the conventional trades. This is another world which requires a completely different kind of general education, focused on analytic and synthetic capabilities and on problem solving. And at the same time, a different kind of technical education, focused on the higher order practical and conceptual capabilities required for the reprogramming as well as the use of numerical machine tools. And that then creates, then you think of general education and practical education as not opposed, but on a continuum. And you don't have this idea that general education is for the elites and practical training is for the masses. Yes? So then how does that interact with the theory about I think it was a split economy theory about like attitudes towards immigration. I mean, if you're in this sense, like if you're kind of changing the way in which like certain forms of education or like perhaps different like locations are being changed, does it then change the attitudes towards like that are established in the article about you know East Asian immigration and that versus like Latin American immigration, like the typical jobs that various different forms of immigrants will work in? Well, maybe. I mean. Certainly, if you look at globalization, and so globalization is not a thing with a defined content. There are different forms that globalization can take. So the, the, the predominant form in the world today is a form whose general character is to promote, to maximize the free movement of things and of capital, of money, across national borders, but to imprison people in the nation state. That's the general character of, of globalization. So, or in blocks of relatively homogeneous states like the European Union. In a different world, a world that moved in the direction of the an inclusive knowledge economy, you would say, we don't want that. We want money, things, and people to acquire little by little in cumulative steps the freedom to cross national frontiers rather than treating them in this radically different way. There's no basis in economic theory, by the way, or in political, either in the theory of democracy or in economics for this radical distinction between the treatment of money and the treatment of people. Yes. that are different from? Uh, political rights. Different from civil versus goods? In terms so of political I think rights. So, so, so this, is, this goes in the direction of another discussion, which is what is the point of the division of humanity into different nations? And the point is, it's, in its ideal limit, it's a form of moral specialization within humanity. Right? You have the different nations are not all trying to converge to establish the form of life. Humanity develops its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. But one of the indispensable safeguards in a world in which the different nations embody this principle of differentiation, of specialization, is that you can't be stuck in a world in, at the end of the day you don't want to belong to. So you have to have the right of escape from one of these worlds. And, and I guess you would, the immediate response is in the form of this 
time when I was saying the problems with that system, you do have that. I guess I'm pushing back on the claim that there's not some actual distinction between people and goods. People no, of course there's a distinction. And so, but so, you're proposing a cosmopolitan vision. No, 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 I'm not. Because, because my idea is and there, so in this, in, in this route, from the old vision in which the nations are tribes based on homogeneity or similarity, that's, one, that's the one side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum are the nations are experiments in different ways of being human and different ways of organizing society. Along that route, there's an accident. The accident is that in order to prosper in their worldwide competition, the nations have to imitate one another. So, like Japan in the 19th century, the Meiji Restoration has to say, we want to remain independent from the Western powers. To remain independent, we have to tear out part of ourselves at this altar of worldwide competition. And uh, imitate something from Prussia or something from the United States. So the tangible collective identities are partly eviscerated. They're not, it's not just a set of porous customs, right? It's a will to be different that paradoxically is inflamed as actual difference wanes. And this accounts for the peculiarly poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. Two nations live side by side, and they come to hate each other, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike, and because they want to be different. It's this impotent rage for difference. Uh, uh, and so what's the attitude then of the different forms of political thinking to this? Liberal cosmopolitanism would say, difference is the problem, suppress difference. We should converge to the same best practices and institutions. Autarkic reactionary nationalism says we should remember and reestablish the ancient differences. But the best solution is to say we should empower the different nations by economic and political arrangements that allow them to invent new difference. Difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. Actual difference, tangible difference, is the solution because tangible difference can always be compromised and mixed. Whereas the intangible will to difference is the problem. So there's this complicated relation between the different schools and this theory of, di of differentiation yes. within humanity. Yeah. Rivers, can you talk about unions, trade unions, as being an outdated solution to a modern problem? And I'm curious how you would sort of explain the high rates of union banking within the public sector, even among sort of like these non-industrial industries, like you know, education. So in a country like the United States, unions survive mainly in public employment and in the third sector, right? Where they weren't expected to exist at all initially on their ancient theory. So this, this is an anomaly and shows the weakness. Uh, I think the Americans and the Europeans have a very limited idea of what unions can look like. That's why I mentioned the Latin American example. There are two union systems that exist in the world. There's the collective bargaining in the North Atlantic world. And there's the other system, which, whose origin actually is Mussolini's fascism, the Carta de la Vado of 1937 but which was adapted in Latin America by the left-leaning populist governments of Cognitus in Mexico, Vargas in Brazil, and Peron in Argentina. And it's based on the opposite principles of the principle of collective bargaining. So collective bargaining is everyone is automatically unionized. No, that's not collective bargaining. Corporatism is everyone is automatically unionized. And the unions are under the tutelage of the state through the Ministry of Labor. So it is a form of controlled popular mobilization. The so collective the state guarantees the voice of the workers. That's, that, that's the 
positive way to put it, right? The state manipulates the workers. The, the, the workers are the, uh, are this constituency that the, the populist government creates for itself. Huh? Uh, that's the point of this corporatist labor law regime and its political reality. The contractualist regime says the unions are purely voluntary. The analogy is to private contracts and therefore also entirely independent from the state. Now, the, the collective bargaining system has three grave defects. The first is that its focus is, na is naturally the need to unionize or not. And as I said, the battle for unionization has to be refought every day. Whereas under the other system, the union is a gift of the law. It's automatic. The second defect is that the tendency of a of collective bargaining regime is for the union structure to express and reinforce the underlying inequalities of the system of production. So in the existing systems of production, some parts of production are capital intensive, others are capital poor. In the capital intensive parts of the production system, the wage is a relatively small part of the financing of production. And the workers have common interests with their employers against everyone else, against the workers in the capital star parts of the economy and so forth. Uh, the, the corporatist regime has a solidaristic tilt. It keeps everyone together and it focuses them on their common interests. The third problem is that the tendency of a collective bargaining regime is to focus on the economistic demands, wages and benefits, whereas the corporatist regime favors a broader institutional agenda by its nature. So the, there can be factions within the union system and they can, uh, be affiliated or not to political parties and ideologies, and they compete for position just as political parties compete for position in the position of, in the in the structure of the democratic state. Yes. Yeah, just to ask a follow-up question, given that sort of like the question you posed in Adam's general, so I think half the country now has a, goes under a right to work regime in certain states. So I'm curious. So what I would propose would be what I call the hybrid regime. As we would take from the corporatist regime the principle of automatic unionization of every worker. But we would take from the collective bargaining regime the principle of complete independence of the unions from the state. Uh, and that would be the solution. And it would at least slow down the process of deunionization. But I have to recognize that the, it may be too late. So the ship may have sailed. That the, the deunionization may now have become irreversible. But I, but, but I, and, the, and, and that's interesting. So first, what's interesting about this is how important it would be to understand that there are alternatives. I think that Basically, no one in the United States, except maybe the two or three people who study comparative labor law, even know about this alternative. So it's not part of the option. Now, the second thing is this point that came up in an earlier discussion here, which is the repertoire of programmatic ideas available in the society at any given point is relatively inelastic. As this discussion about labor law demonstrates, uh, and it matters when it's discovered, when an option is discovered. So I'm saying, here it is. This would be extremely useful to the United States, but it may be too late. You know, it's, we, uh, we, there's a life to these ideas, uh, the societies, the individuals. We all know that none of us is going to get out of here alive and so forth, and so it may, it may be too late. I mean, could, but through a voice, could, could one mobilize this idea so that it spreads and then has... I don't think one should be fixated on the union form of this idea. 
because now it becomes principally just a historical curiosity. I think we would, it would be wiser for us to look for the other possible focal points of collective organization and countervailing power in some broader sense, like the two I suggested, in, uh, and a, 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 an equivalent, a contemporary equivalent to the agricultural extension in the 19th century, an industrial equivalent to it, which requires coordination between the state and the producers and cooperative competition among the producers. And the second focal point would be the provision of public services involving organized civil society to create its own future. So if we failed by our ignorance, by our lack of imagination to find one thing, history will provide us with other opportunities to go on to the next thing. I think don't you be fixated that on the battle that you've lost. That's, but you think that that would, that's, has a greater possibility of being implemented than resuscitating unions, which is still, yes. more people are familiar. I mean, most Americans have, are, are completely ignorant about their history. So we first have to educate them so that they understand the history. That would be good, right? <laughs> I mean, if you, could, if you could develop the institutional imagination in that way, but yes. good luck. Yes, yeah. Uh, so shall we go on now to the, our next discussion? Yeah. Does someone else want to? Yes. I've never, never used the microphone thing before. Um, maybe I'm not totally understanding, but is the goal of sort of this new model of unionization to allow people to better participate in the knowledge economy, or is it balancing power between no, the I sort of educating no, in no, this no, no. broader? I haven't, no, I haven't related this suggestion of the hybrid model to the task of creating an inclusive knowledge economy. It came up in another context. It came up in this discussion about the dying world, the vanishing world, in which work, there was a stable labor force, they were in these big productive units, uh, they had good jobs, uh, they lived in their communities and so forth. It's that world. Uh, I haven't even thought about what this would mean for the inclusive knowledge economy. And that's what, and I don't want to show any special affection for this idea, I think it goes down with it's 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 a solu it's a solution for a world that is capsizing, that is sinking. So let it sink. You know, uh, Christ said, "Let the dead bury the dead." I don't know, I'm not going to try and resuscitate them. One could perhaps reinvent this idea in some other form for the knowledge economy, but that's something to think about. It's not something that I've thought about. So I, I think the starting point which I wanted to propose now for our discussion is uh, to realize the promise, the potential of American democracy. Uh, what are the obstacles now to confront? The fact is that the progressives in the United States, within or outside the Democratic Party, have failed to come up with a sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. That's right. That's right. And they have a series of substitutes for this sequel that are quite evidently inadequate. Uh, so I'd like to discuss them one by one, uh, because this will help us understand the the political geography and the imaginative geography of this of situation, are, of right. where we are, right? right? And the first is race and class. First is race and class, because there's, a, at least from the standpoint of an outsider like me looking in on the American situation, there's a huge obstacle in the way that race and class are related in the United States. So the dominant paradigm in American history is there's this huge problem of African slavery. Yes. There had to be a war uh, 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 to resolve it. Yes. Uh, but now it's had a huge, a long aftermath. It casts a long shadow 
in American history. So having defeated it in its essence, it's now necessary to defeat it in its, in its aftermath. Yeah. Yeah? Although in a sense it wasn't even defeated in its essence because yeah. by the period of redemption, um, which is the end of re the period following the reconstruction, and over 95, 90 to 95% of African Americans were still living in the former rebel states. They were mm -hmm. tied to their land. They had no freedom of movement, yeah. uh, which is the fundamental definition of freedom. Um, all of the, the southern state laws prohibited African Americans from leaving their county. Uh, and it's why the Great Migration uh, was a revolution and it transformed the nation, but there was a long period in which yeah. um, African Americans, 90% of African Americans were still tied to the former rebel states yeah. uh, through legal uh, laws and uh, mass incarceration and uh, lasted until the beginning yes. of the, the, uh, uh, the Great Migration. So I don't want this discussion of race and class to take over our whole time now. It could easily take over right, a whole right. hour. So I will state my position okay. schematically, provocatively, and with radical simplification. Okay. So it seems to me that in American history, there have been four main approaches to the relation between race and class. I want to describe them in order to present my idea of what would be necessary. So. First, there's been the accommodationist or collaborationist idea, exemplified, for example, by Booker T. Washington right. immediately after the Civil War. The idea that the blacks should accommodate to the predominant society, and they should assume a subaltern position in that society. As petty entrepreneurs, shopkeepers, petty landowners, and so forth. Not rock the boat, but accommodate or collaborate. Right. Uh, I think the paradox of this position is that to achieve this seemingly, seemingly modest objective, actually there would have to be a huge amount of mass mobilization. And if, and if there were that mass mobilization necessary to secure the objective that the collaborationists wanted, it's implausible politically that they would have had such a short horizon. They would have, uh, so there's a, a contradiction between the intensity of the mobilization needed and the modesty of the objective. Now, the second position is the, is the secessionist position actually escape from the United States, going to Africa, leaving the United States, or in the absence of actually leaving it, then some internal exile. And this is the position which I suppose is represented by Marcus Garvey and... and yeah, I mean, Garvey, but you could also see the Great Migration. Is yeah. That, is that, no. Now, I think the paradox of this position is that although it seems literally to be radical, yes. then let's cut our relations in the United States. In its actual presentation in American life, it's very similar to the accommodationist position. That is, you take, for example, Farrakhan uh -huh. uh, as representing doctrinally this position, what results is a society characterized by petty bourgeois norms of respectability. Uh, parallel separate from the larger white society, but ensconced within it. Yes. I don't want to focus on this because this is just a little, it's, I know that everything I'm saying is controversial, yes. but it's just, so now comes the third position, and the third position is the one that has become the orthodox position in the United States, and that's what you can call the threshold position. It was the one that, that, that uh, Martin Luther King and his school described as integrationist, but I would prefer to call you this word threshold because the idea is that class is separate from race. And the class is, and the race issue has to be 
addressed as an antecedent condition in order to address race separately. And uh, so it's this huge obstacle which can't be confused or mixed up with race. And of course, something that facilitates or makes it at least thinkable in the United States is the one drop rule, this radical barrier between white and black with no massive racial miscegenation in the country. Now, then let's take affirmative action as an example of the practical results of this view. So what has it done? What are its evils? First is it generates benefits that are in inverse proportion to the need for them. So it most benefits the black elite, professional and business class. It benefits less the black working class in public employment especially like policemen, firemen, and so forth, whom at least benefits are who the people who really need the benefit most, where the masses of poor blacks who fill the American prisons and are in precarious employment in the secondary part of the labor market. The second uh, evil which it has done is that it separates this black elite from the mass of poor blacks, accommodates the black elite, who as virtual representatives of the, of the mass get benefits for themselves, but abandon the mass. So there's an estrangement between the elite and the rank and file of the black. The third evil is that it offends the white working class majority of the country, which with some justice believes itself to be the victim of a conspiracy between the sanctimonious whites and this estranged black leadership. So I think it's no good. But uh, is that gap, isn't that gap similar to the gap in whites between the working class of whites course it is. Of course. and the elite? The, uh, the, the, of course it is. Of course it the is. Light, the lights of course. in schools like this. Of course it is. Uh, but that's the whole point, that instead of forming the blacks into a transformative movement, not only for their own sake, but for the sake of the whole country. It makes of the black movement a, a mirror of the situation of the whites, as you just suggested. So uh, now, what's the alternative? Yeah, what's the uh, so, so, so first of all, let me say the fourth position in American history, uh -huh. claiming, is the position briefly and fragmentarily represented by the work of the Freedmen's Bureau in the years after the Civil War, yes. which is to connect race and class, yes. and represented by the figure we're going to discuss next week, a few long, yes. in Louisiana. Yes, it connects race, but it also required a, a vigorous, which was the flaw of Reconstruction, a vigorous army to ensure that, um, to ensure the uh, uh, protection of course, of course, and in the reality, it was very fragile very and closed fragile. down yes, uh, yes, yes. because it was something that was that threatened the structure of the country. That's right. Uh, so there'd have to be, in a sense, a police state, um, a vigorous police no, state. Simply, simply that there was a, the idea of connecting race and class. Right, right. There were slogans like 40 acres and a mule," with this idea that the cause of supersession of the sh long shadow of slavery was inseparable from the economic reconstruction of the country. Now, let me give an example of a proposal that would result today from this way of thinking uh, with respect to civil rights and affirmative action and so forth. It would say, let's separate radically individualized racial discrimination from the collective promotion of the disadvantage of the subjugated. Individualized racial discrimination should be sanctioned and even criminalized, as it is in many countries. It's a crime. And, but the collective promotion has to be based on actual disadvantage. There's no way in which, for example, we're going to promote the cause, the interests of Nigerian princes at Harvard College in the name of a policy of anti-discrimination. 
We're not going to do that kind of thing. We're going to focus on an actual advantage and an actual disadvantage. And in the structure of disadvantage in a class society, what typically happens is that class is the principal element, and the other elements are aggravations of class. Because we've separated off the issue of dis individualized discrimination, and that we're going to criminalize, and now we're concerned with the structural question of disadvantage. And in the, in the, in the construction of that structural thing, there have to be structural solutions to structural problems. And the focus is then on class. Class is the primordial element. The other elements are aggravations of class. So if we have a policy that is focused on actual disadvantage, then naturally, in the great majority of situations, class will be the preponderant element. And that sets us on a different direction right, right. from the direction taken by what I call the threshold view, which separates race from class and treats the supersession of racial injustice or oppression as an antecedent condition to dealing with class injustice. So uh, elaborate on the so long as I don't have to elaborate too much. <laughs> <laughs> on this, uh, on, on uplifting on uh, the, uh, the, the poor class, the, the working, the working poor. Well, that's all the discussion we're going to have, for example, about the, the insular knowledge economy. So the uplift operation uh, has, has two main targets. Right? One target are the small and medium-sized firms of the backward economy, the backward parts of the production system, the industrial equivalents to the beneficiaries of 19th century agricultural extension. Right. And the other target are the great multitude of individualized economic agents who no longer have any stable relation to any business organization. That's a large part of the labor force in the United States and in all the countries in the world. Because the emergence of the insular knowledge economy has coincided with the abandonment of a large part of the labor force right. to precarious employment. Right. Huh? Right. And so then they become the objects of this uplift. Yes. Yes. But, but the uplift is different from the problem of discrimination, which we're separating off and we're going to deal with as an entity in its own right. That's the heart of this way of thinking. Right. So <coughs> elaborate on how we deal with it. Of deal with which? Individualized discrimination? Uh, no, deal with the, the, work, the working poor, or the poor. But, but that's the object of the economic discussion we're going to have. I'm not going to discuss that now, because okay, okay. we're going to have that in, what, two, or two, two weeks right, from now. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so the, I, I take your question. So then the second, it would lead to the second theme is um, compensatory redistribution. That's right. So then the second obstacle is this. What do the American progressives now in general want? I think that what they in general want is they want the United States to become more like the Sweden of the 1970s. That's what they want. Meaning they want a high level of compensatory redistribution by progressive taxation and redistribute social entitlement. So you think that's, most Americans want that? That, I said the progressives, I oh, didn't okay, say okay, most okay, Americans. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Remember when <laughs> Adlai Stevenson was in his campaign and, and uh, someone shouted from the audience, all thinking people support you. And he said, yes, but I need the support of the majority. So. We're, uh, we're not talking about the majority. We're talking about what, what do the progressives want. They, want? they have a false idea of the Sweden of the 1970s as a high level of entitlements and compensatory redistribution. So I, I, and I'm going to now schematically, in my schematic summary form, address this thesis. 
And I'm going to do so in the form of three principles, which are in hierarchical order. <laughs> the consequences of the Jesuit education. So the first, the first principle is struck in, in combating inequality. Everything that has to do with the transformation of the structure, the institutional structure, economic and political, and therefore with the primary distribution of advantage and opportunity, economic and educational, matters much more than anything that you can do after the fact through retrospective compensatory redistribution. So, the crucial concepts here are the original or primary distribution and the secondary distribution. So it's very simple. The, imagine that you think this way. The market as it exists is a huge machine for the creation of wealth. Unfortunately, the market generates inequality, but it doesn't matter because we'll come after the fact and we'll cancel out all of these inequalities that the market generates. Now, of course, this is, not, this is not real because if the market generates vast inequalities and you try and cancel them out, if you say it did all of this, the market created all of this, but then we'll take it all back, then you are subverting the established economic arrangements and incentives the incentives to save, to invest, and employ. You can't do that. Compa corrective retrospective redistribution can only have an accessory or subordinate role. It can't replace structural change. Structural change is the main thing. What you do after the fact through corrective redistribution is only attenuates or enhances the effect of what you try to do structurally. So that's the most important thing. Structural change trumps corrective redistribution. Now, this is a key to understanding the falsity, for example, of the theories of justice, of distributive justice, that are propounded in the Anglo-American world, like the Rawlsian theory of justice. They combine an egalitarian profession of faith with institutional skepticism or conservatism. So they are abstract principles which justify corrective redistribution. And what they really are is the use of a philosophical contraption or a pseudo-philosophical contraption to justify the homely practices of compensatory redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. So now uh, I, am a, I am recognizing, and now we come to the second principle in my hierarchical order. Does that mean that corrective redistribution has no role? No, it does have a role. But it is a subordinate accessory role which has to be understood in its proper context. And to introduce that theme, let me then present an enigma, a paradox. I, if you compare the tax systems of the rich North Atlantic democracies, the tax system that on paper <coughs> is most egalitarian is the American. Because uh, it gives a central role to the progressive taxation of personal income. But the United States, as we all know, is by far the most unequal of the rich industrial democracies. The tax systems of the relatively more egalitarian European social democracies are on paper much more regressive because they're all organized around the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or some functional equivalent to it as in France. Now, how can we explain this? How can it be that the more unequal country has a more progressive tax system and the unequal ones have the more regressive and the more equal one has the more regressive tax system? 
The explanation is the following. The only thing that matters in the short term to the progressive impact of the budget, taking its two sides together, the revenue raising side and the spending side, is the aggregate level of the tax debt and how it is spent. The simple explanation for this paradox is that the Europeans take at least 10% more of GDP in as tax take than the Americans. And they spend it redistributively. So everything that they've lost by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget, they gain in double on the spending side. And why are they able to take in more tax? They're able to take in more tax because the comprehensive flat rate value added tax is conceptually the most neutral tax possible. Imagine the economy as an input-output table, uh, in the style of Leontia, that, and the tax takes a constant proportion of the transformation of, every, of the value of the transformation of every input into an output. So if it is kept completely neutral, it is neutral with respect to the system of relative prices. And that's what makes it possible to maximize the tax take, minimizing the economic trauma. So in the United States, the progressives, politicians at election time, all wrap themselves in the, model, in the mantle of progressive taxation. Although they know, or should know, that progressive taxation has a com completely marginal effect on the distribution of economic advantage. The income tax, in particular, is a false tax, because the income tax is rich people do not pay the income tax, basically, in any country in the world. The income tax is basically a tax on the salaries of the so-called middle class. Right. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a true redistributive tax, but it is a tax to which the progressive politicians in the United States genuflect because they clearly prefer progressive pieties to transformative effects. Uh, that's the meaning of their agitation. Uh, uh, so that's the second principle. So forget about progressive taxation in the short term. Focus simply on the aggregate level of the tax take and on how it's spent. Now we come to the third principle, down the hierarchy of principles. Now, suppose you want to insist on your redistributive ambitions, and I, I take your good faith uh, <laughs> sincerely as authentic. What, in principle, are the two targets of redistributive taxation? They are, first, the hierarchy of standards of living, and second, the accumulation of economic power. Those two targets exhaust completely the field of progressive taxation. One of the reasons why the income tax is such an unreasonable tax is that it hits neither of these targets squarely. Uh, so how are you to reach the hierarchy of standards of living by taxation? It's very simple. You do it through a tax that after the Second World War, Caldor theorized in his book, An Expenditure Tax, published in 1955. Uh, so what is the individualized consumption tax? You take the aggregate income of the individual, income to labor and income to capital, you put it together and you subtract invested savings. That difference between aggregate income and invested savings is what the individual spends on his way of living. That's the basis, the source of the hierarchy of standards of living. So then you take that difference and it's, it has no technical difficulties of administration. The individualized consumption tax has no difficulties of practical administration additional to the income tax. It's the same thing. Because everything that the individual can't demonstrate as invested saving 
counts as if it had been spent and is therefore an object of the tax. So you take that difference and you tax it on a steeply progressive slope. So beneath a certain threshold, the individual pays nothing. He receives from the state. That's what the Americans call the negative income tax. As it goes up the slope, he pays more and more. But at the highest level, 100% is not the highest tax rate. The highest tax rate is the sky's the limit. Based, it's, on, it's, based on that work. Sorry, based on consumption, consumption and right. on the, what the individual That's spends that. on himself. Which is so, for example, you could say if you had, if you, if you were sufficiently sincere in your redistributive <laughs> intentions and had enough political power that beyond a certain level of luxury living, for every dollar you spend on yourself, you pay five dollars to the state. So then the highest rate is 500 percent. There's no limit. The limit is the limit of political power and redistributive ambition. Uh, and now, what about the other target, the accumulation of economic power? That's much harder to read through taxation. And by far the most effective way to reach it is at the moment of death. A confiscatory tax on inheritance, on the hereditary transmission of property, or anticipated inheritance right. through gifts and survivors in the family. And what percentage? What percentage? The more you get, the, the more the better, I would say. I'm not opposed to redistribution. I just think that its practical effect is entirely secondary compared to structural change. So those three principles then explain redistribution. So instead of having this silly battle about equity and efficiency, have clear-sighted ideas about redistribution in the market, and this is what you do. Then you remove the second obstacle, which is the phony, we need to become like Sweden of the 1970s business. Does someone want to make, have make So how, uh, how do you envision the, the transformation and implementation of this vision? I, I'm saying, well, what I'm, can I haven't come with what I think is the main thing, okay. which is the system of production, right? right. I mean, right. race and class are a kind of self-imposed incubus it's like the Americans have trained themselves by these illusions about the relation between race and class. And this compensatory redistribution is just phony compared to structural change. And so you want redis if you really want redistribution after you've had structural change, this is how you do it. You don't do it that way. You don't do it by fiddling with the rate of the income tax and so forth, which is how they do it. Huh? <laughs> then we come to the third debate, which is then the debate about production. Right. And that, I don't want to say much about that now because that's the subject of our future discussion. But the fundamental, pro the fundamental problem is very clear. There's an insular knowledge economy uh, that a tiny minority of the country is in. Uh, they're the masters of this economy. They're surrounded by the paraphernalia, a periphery of service providers, right. lawyers, accountants, right. tax preparers, estate planners, uh, these paper pushers that are the penumbra right. the uh, of, of these things. And everyone else is the in the country is basically stuck in some kind of make work. So that's the basic structure. Uh, and it's, it's the, the attack on that structure is a central problem of the country if the message of the American prophets is to be both honored and corrected, right. as I suggested earlier on in the course. <laughs> so, uh, and then we have to discuss what are the educational requirements for the overcoming of this insularity? What are its social and moral requirements? Because it requires organization of civil society, right. accumulation of social capital, right. 
And above all, whether it's legal and institutional requirement, we have to reinvent the market order. So the elite of Silicon Valley and the platform oligopolies look around and say, why are the rest like us? Uh, as if it were simply a problem of horizontal extension. It's not. It requires a particular sequence of consequential institutional transformations, not the sugarcoating of compensatory redistribution. Huh? So that's the third problem. And now we come to the fourth problem, which is finance. The financialization of the American economy. I do want to say a word about that, because that's directly related to the immediate historical context and, for example, to the crisis that the country went through in 2007, 2008. Uh -huh. um, so the intellectual starting point is the idea that finance can be more closely linked or more separated from production. So the theory of the theory of finance is that a perfectly competitive capital market automatically generate, uh, allocates resources to its most effective user, users. If there is some deficiency in the efficient allocation of resources, it must be because there's a flaw in competition. And if there's a flaw in competition, you correct it or you give a equally localized regulatory response to the localized competitive flaw. But what you don't admit in this orthodox way of thinking is the idea that the whole capital market, the system of finance, the institutional arrangements of finance can be more closely linked or more separated from production. So, and it's, that's precisely the point on which I want to insist. Different ways of organizing the market economy and different ways of organizing the relation of finance to production can increase the, the, the size of finance, it's high, can increase its hypertrophy, but not deepen its connection to production. So we have to distinguish financial hypertrophy from financial deepening. The general principle is that the best way to make finance less dangerous is to make it more useful. Right. Uh, and we start from these enigmas that under the existing forms, the production system is largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. Well over 80% of the financing of production is generated internally in the production system. So what's the point of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets, supposedly invested in the companies? Right. Invested means <coughs> serving as the object of these speculative trades among the owners. Uh, sure, there's, there's sure. sort of right. simply oblique, re an episodic relation, mm -hmm. for example, in, in every initial public offerings, or an oblique pretended relation because the stock market can establish a benchmark of values against which the companies supposedly borrow. Right. But the companies don't borrow. Most of the huge corporations in the United States have vast pools of liquid capital that they don't know what to do with. And they go to the capital markets as customers and financiers right. rather than as producers. That's right. So that's the <coughs> reality. The second enigma is that the financial system is indifferent to the real economy in good times and becomes destructive in bad times. Uh, because financial instability spills over and harms real activity. The third enigma is that the most important responsibility of finance in principle is the funding of the creation of new assets in new ways. And that would be the responsibility of venture capital and the associated forms of finance. Even in the countries in the world in which venture capital is most established, like the United States and Israel, it's a minuscule portion of total financial activity. It's 
frankly irrelevant quantitatively. Huh? But that's what would be most important. Now, what's the solution to these episodes? The solution is to tighten the link by this, first of all, in the short term, by discouraging financial activity that has no, makes no plausible contribution to the expansion of output and the enhancement of productivity. So, for example, options contracts right, right. in the financial markets made an undoubted contribution to liquidity in commodity markets right. for agriculture. Right. But in equity markets, they were transformed from being an antidote to gambling to being a device of gambling, right. Right. which is what they largely are now, and so forth. Right. And then positive arrangements in which you try and tap some of the vast unspent capital of society in the public and private pension systems of the world and put them in diversified portfolios to do the undone, undone work of venture capital. And then far in the future, the, the, the auctioning off of capital, the means of production, to the most effective use of huh? Now, United States in 2007, 2008 went through a crisis. The dominant strategy, regulatory strategy, uh, regulation of finance is what you could call regulatory dualism. It's distinguished between a thickly regulated sector and a thinly regulated sector. And the justification for this distinction was an argument of paternalism. The thickly regulated sector is populated, the thickly regulated sector is the sector of the general public. The thinly regulated sector is populated by high net worth individuals and financial professionals who supposedly don't need protection. Right. Huh? Right. So what happened was that all the activities and products prohibited in the thickly regulated sector were repackaged and relabeled and then done in the thinly regulated sector. That was one of the triggers to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And it resulted directly from this strategy of regulatory dualism, which separated finance from production, right? right. right. Uh, then comes the crisis and there's a response and all the responses left the basic relation between finance and production untouched. There were four projects. There was a partial revival of the old New Deal project of separating propriet pr proprietary trading right. from, from federally insured deposit right. banking. Right. Huh? Then there was a new technocratic agenda of increasing the power of the federal government to liquidate and restructure bank holding organizations that were supposedly too big to fail. Then there was the project of the international financial elite headquartered in the Bank of International Settlements in Basel to increase the capital adequacy of the banks. And finally, there was the consumer protection project. Consumers of the Bureau of consumer protection and financial service. All these projects together did nothing to change the fundamental relation of finance to production, which was after all the, and in fact, they didn't even dispose of the strategy of regulatory dualism, which continues even to this day to be the dominant strategy in the regulation of finance. So, the productivist project would require the transformation of the insular knowledge economy to an inclusive knowledge economy, the replacement of the knowledge economy for a few by a knowledge economy for the many, and then as accessory to that larger project, then a transformation of the relation of finance to production. So that finance, instead of being allowed to be a bad servant a bad master is forced to become a good servant. That's what one would desire. So there would be, need to be dramatic change in the regulations re re related to finance. 
Yes, I mean, so, so the strategy of regulatory dualism would have to be abandoned. Yes. As a fiasco yes. failure. Yes. yes. And a series of initiatives designed to promote, to avoid financial hypertrophy and promote financial equity. So now, uh, a large part of the graduating class leading American universities goes into these banks and right, right. Uh, right. Banks, and uh, finance gobbles up a huge amount of profit. Profit and talent, blood of, of the American, the energy of the American democracy. Uh, and this is, so, and the progressives, where are they? So they, they presented the wrong idea of the relation between race and class, the wrong attitude to corrective redistribution, and to the relation between the secondary distribution and the primary distribution. No project for the transformation of the production system, and no fundamental change in the relation of finance to production. And now the productivist initiatives that are proposed in the United States through the CHIPS Act, for example, or the Inflation Reduction Act, if you study them in their details, are mainly subsidies to factions of capital. So insofar as they have a productive outcome, a productivist outcome, the productivist outcome is entirely ancillary to the main job, which is subsidizing factions of capital. So that's all I wanted to say by way of provoking the discussion. So, and yeah, how, how would you fix it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm simply describing elements in this situation that would have to be addressed. Right. And each of them, if you put them all together, it seems like an impossible mountain to climb. But if you look at the, each of them separately, each of them lends itself to a series of accretive marginal innovations, many of which are already in the field of discussion. Right. Huh? Right. So what's necessary is to understand the picture as a whole, right. to, form, to, to, to form an idea which puts structural change at the center right. Right. and puts redistributive correction in its place. That's what's necessary. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, to your point about um, sort of the primary redistribution versus uh, sort of second redistribution, yes. would you, for example, yesterday the there's a one billion dollar donation to the Albert Einstein Medical School to make medical school tuition for free for Social Security for those students? Would that be an example of structural change? In well, I, that's a very good question because I think that let, let's take this situation of of European social democracy. I'm a critic of European social democracy, I think, and its origin lies a retreat, right, from the attempt to reform the worlds of power and production. But it had an undoubted historical achievement, which was to maintain a high level of investment in people and in their capabilities, paradoxically financed as I pointed out, through the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. And I think that that investment in health and education has a, a double character because it is corrective redistribution in a sense, but it is also transformation of the structure because it's taking the basic agents of the society, the people, and increasing their capabilities. Huh? And, and that's an investment in the long term of production. It's interesting that over all these decades since the Second World War, no right-wing party or government in Europe has ever succeeded in achieving a substantial diminishment of the tax base. Because the European populations, independently of the divisions between right and left, understand their state as a, as the result of a social contract, a social compact.
they pay very high taxes, and in return they obtain this high level of investment in people, in health, in education, in security, and no one has wanted to give that up, on the right or on the left. So it's been a stable, lasting achievement. And I think we have to understand it in this way. Now, it's not an adequate solution to the problems of society. And you, and you can think of it in the following vocabulary. So, the overwhelming preoccupation of social democracy uh, is to give people a haven against the insecurities of the market. Uh, and, uh, but why do we want to give people a haven? We want to give people a haven so that they can act and thrive in the midst of a storm of innovation and change. So social democracy has all this discourse about the haven, but has nothing about the storm. The storm doesn't occur spontaneously. The storm needs to be arranged. And I think that this idea that there can't be just the haven, the haven is for the sake of movement in the storm, is something that is responsive to the genius of American democracy. Uh, the, the Americans who are antipathetic to the idea of just providing a haven would be more sympathetic to the haven if they understood that it was the counterpart of the storm. Other questions, comments? So, so I think that this, this, this discussion about it Corrective redistribution is a very important part of the story. Right. Right? The, and the inadequacy of the secondary distribution is captured in the familiar rhetor rhetoric of the tension between equity and efficiency. You can't have the idea that you'll create a market, that the market will produce all these savage results and you'll come after the fact and you'll cancel them out through some form of correction. That doesn't work. Right. You can't cancel them out. It, the corrective redistribution would have to achieve, long before it achieved achieve the requisite dimension to allow it to cancel out the results, would begin to disorganize the real economy. So, Corrective redistribution is not the answer to the problem of inequality. The answer to the problem of inequality is structural change. Shaping the primary distribution of opportunity and advantage. Corrective redistribution has an important secondary role, not just in expanding the impact of the structural change, but in doing what we were discussing the Europeans did, in this investment in people and their capabilities that has a second, a, a second significance. It's, it's, it participates in the character of corrective redistribution, but it also participates in the shaping of the original distribution. And it therefore qualifies also as structural change. Right. I mean, in a sense, both are structural forms of structural change, but one is much more structural than the other. Which is the one that you're calling more structural? The one that you just mentioned. Uh, the one, uh, a people, yes, the agents. Yes, the yeah. people as agents. Yeah. That's far more. Their, their capacity for agency. Yes. Uh, which, after all, is the most powerful ideal in the world. Yes. yes. And the point of all of this in this discussion of democracy is not just to pacify people, to, to keep them well fed and housed and so forth. It's the enhancement of agency. Right, right, it's right. the elevation of the life of the ordinary man and woman to a higher level right, yeah. of scope, intensity, capability. Right. That's the point. Right. And that's why one should say that the object of ambition of the progressives forever 
was not the humanization of society, was the divinization of humanity, which are elevated <coughs> to a higher form of life. And that's what's captured in that message of the American prophet. Right, right, that's right. Whereas the, um, uh, by empowering individuals leads to greater structural right. change. So, and that goes in, to the immediate circumstances of American politics, right? Right. Because the question is, why is there this plutocratic populism? Why is, why is it possible? And you have to understand the failure of the progressives in the United That's States right. Right. to offer an alternative responsive to the interests and aspirations of the white working class majority of the country. Right. Right. But isn't it largely just based on, on power that trumps democracy. How do you strip mm. power from, uh, from... But didn't the people have to vote for this alternative? How could, how could, how could the progressives have so completely estranged the popular base of the country? I think by by emphasizing the status and the value of wealth, of defining oneself solely by wealth in terms of uh, success. So in other words, um, repudiating the producer's vision and uh, and the, ima the imaginative capacities of individuals and having the, 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 the framework of the status be um, the wealth of any individual rather than the, um, the creativity or the capacity to turn the table. The capacity to turn the table, the, the capacity for change, the capacity to, um, to uh, explore and to invent new things. Um, freedom, both in terms of voice and in terms of work. I think that's the essential idea, the idea of freedom. Yeah. That was Tocqueville's mistake yes. when he yes. thought that the United States was all about equality. That's right. Yes. When in fact it's yeah. all about freedom. Yes. Yes. And, and that's the question that, that's in play now. Right. Of what is the meaning of freedom? Right. Yeah. Both say for most Americans, free, freedom is, is intimately connected um, to, the, to wealth, to, to, to money, um, to uh, uh, the possibilities of having it or acquiring it or acquiring more. And because of the impoverished idea of self-fashioning. Yes, exactly. Solidarity. The self-fashioning of most I mean, Americans. Why does, why does is it not said that the principle of construction of the early English novel is accumulation? Accumulation of things, like Robinson Crusoe accumulates yes, things yes, on his island. Yes, yes, yes. Now, why does he accumulate things on his island? He accumulates things on his island so as not to depend on people. Right, right, so right. the accumulation of things is the alternative to solidarity. Yes, 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 yes. And true freedom depends on connection. Yes. And Although there's a, a, a arguably a more powerful strain in which freedom is based on um, a disconnection on the isolado, <laughs> the isolado figure, whether it's you know, Daniel Boone or um, these these or or uh, uh, who can name a number of figures today, Elon Musk, uh, these isolados who see who envision themselves as individually without any help, transforming 
a nation or a culture? It has to be represented some different way, that the individual has to rebel yes. against the conformity. Yeah. But what renders action fertile and productive of transformation is solidarity. Yeah, we're outside.